I had two heart attacks in one year, uh, and I was finally diagnosed with congestive heart failure. And later my heart began enlarging. So the transplant was my only option. I had no strength, no energy. It took, uh, I had to rest after getting up from bed, had to rest to drive to work, had to rest once I got to work, if I did any walking. It, it was just an exhausting time. The waiting list was hard, but when you had to think about what you're waiting for, waiting for someone else to die so you can live is a hard pill to swallow. He was 18 when he died, and he was one of the first people to register through DPS in the state of Texas. So that's why I'm doing this because uh, we want the DPS people to know that it is important that you ask those questions. Would you like to be a donor? Although it was hard, both waiting and then accepting the donation, I got to spend an extra four years here on Earth. I got to see my mom turn 87. I got to see great, great, nieces born, there are now one and two. I got to see great nieces and nephews born, there are ages four, three, two. <laughs>Until 2010, Donate Life Texas was one of the lowest performing donor registries in the nation. That changed when DPS employees began asking all customers if they would like to register as organ donors. Since DPS employees started asking the question, the number of donors registering each month has increased by more than 700%. Today, an average of 150,000 Texans are registering to be donors every month. This commitment by DPS is saving lives and taking a huge burden off of Texas families. Since you guys have been asking the question actively since 2010, we have been rocking and rolling, registering more people than any other registry in the nation, and I want you guys to really understand what a difference you're making because lives are being saved every day from registered donors, but they wouldn't be registered if you weren't asking the question. First of all, it is not your responsibility as a DPS employee to answer people's questions about organ donation. It is not your responsibility. I'm here to teach you and give you all the information that you can possibly need about it so that you will have the answers and feel comfortable asking the question. But if people are asking you questions, all you have to do is give them a small orange brochure that you have in your office so that you can refer them to us and we'll answer their questions or if it is a simple question that you feel comfortable answering, you can answer it quickly, but I know that your DPS leadership doesn't want you taking 20 minutes having a conversation about organ donation because that's not gonna meet your goals. There are more than 100,000 people in our country waiting for an organ, and that's a giant number, and sometimes it's hard to even get that number in your head, what does that mean? Some of these big stadiums that we watch football games in 100,000 people can fit in those stadiums. So we're talking a stadium full. A small city has 100,000 population. So the whole size of a small city in our country is waiting for a life-saving organ. And the idea of waiting, if you haven't done it and if you don't know anyone who has, imagine going to the grocery store. You know how there's always long lines and you think, well, I'll get in this one, but then that one moves. Mm -hmm. And then you think, well, I'll get in that one and then the other one moves. But waiting, is it fun? Do you like waiting for anything? But imagine that you had to wait now for something that you could not live without. 30,000 people, more than 30,000 each year, get the transplant they need. So the numbers are good, people are getting transplants, but every single day about 18 or 20 people die. 18 or 20 people. Now that's a statistic, right? But if one of those people who dies is someone that you love, is that a statistic anymore? There are up to eight organs that can be donated by one single potential organ donor, and nine lives can be saved with those organs. You've got, each person has a heart, two lungs, two kidneys, a liver, a pancreas, and an intestine. And the reason that those eight organs can save nine lives is because the liver is a really unique organ and it can be split. It's got two lobes, 
a small lobe that can actually save a child's life, and then a large lobe that can save an adult life. Up to 40 or more people, besides the organs, organ recipients, can be helped by tissues that people donate. So one potential organ donor can help up to 50 or more people, and the tissues are things like corneas and heart valves and ligaments and tendons and all sorts of wonderfully helpful, helpful things that can be transplanted in people to enhance their lives greatly. Most people who die will never be in a position to be an organ donor. In order to be an organ donor, a person has to die in a hospital on a ventilator. I don't know that most people know that. So the organ donation process can't happen if somebody's in a car accident and they die at the scene, or if somebody dies at home and they're not rushed to a hospital in an effort to save their life because they're already dead. They can't be an organ donor. Out of the over two million people who die in the United States every year, only about 1% or 20,000 people, we're starting to really get into small numbers now, 20,000 people die in the United States in a hospital on a ventilator in any given year. So that's our universe that we start with for potential organ donors, but not everyone who dies in a hospital on a ventilator is going to be able to be a donor. About 5,000 of the people who die in a hospital on a ventilator each year are medically ruled out for either HIV, cancer, or some other communicable situation, or the organs just don't work. So now we have an entire universe of 15,000, see what's happening here? <laughs> 15,000 medically suitable potential organ donors in the whole country in any given year. If they're under 18, the family still has say and legal authorization, so that means the family can still say no even if their teenage child is registered. But if the person who registered is 18 or older, then the family has no official say. We don't let the family overrule that decision. And that's new since 2006. That's brand new, very exciting, very important for people who register because the message is this. Yeah, still tell your family, that's a good thing, but they can't override your decision. This registry gives you the power to take that decision in your own hands and make that decision for yourself. And it doesn't put the burden on your family anymore as well. A lot of times when you see in the news that somebody's waiting and they're on a list, but it's different than this list because there's the adult list and the kid list and the this list and the that list, there's one list. <laughs> there's just one list. If people are waiting for organs, they're on the same list as everybody else. But what happens is when we figure out which organs are ready to be transplanted and can be, we input the donor's information, and really all we input is the donor's body size and blood group. The computer rules out all the people that don't match the criteria that we just put in about the donor. And then it takes all the people that are left over that could be a match for this organ, and it prioritizes them based on a whole bunch of things. One of them is waiting time, how long the person's been on the list. One of them is how sick they are, what kind of sick they are, blah, 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 lots of stuff. But the computer does all of that, rules out the people that can't have the organ, and then prioritizes the one that can, ones that can, and then it generates a list for us. And then what we do is we start at the top of the list for each organ, each organ gets its own list, and we start making phone calls to match those organs. So once the call comes in, we check the registry. Whether we have authorization or not, we go to the hospital when someone's on a ventilator because that family needs counseling. That family needs someone to talk them through what has happened because if it was someone I love and they died on a ventilator, I could have a PhD, two master's degrees, I can understand brain death, but that's my child, he's not dead, right? And so we're there to do what the family needs us to do to help them understand that that has happened. Sometimes what we will do is actually disconnect the ventilator for a short period of time and do what's called an apnea test, which will show the family that the person won't breathe without the ventilator. But you can only do that for a short period of time or the organs don't get oxygen and that's not good. There are other tests that we can do to show the family that there is no blood flow between the brain and the body, to show them that the brain has died. We want to make sure that when we're talking to a family in that situation, before we ever start talking about organ donation, whether we have authorization or not, we want to make sure that the family knows that their loved one has passed away. And we also want to make sure they know that everything that could have been done to save that person's life was done. Because if they don't know those two things, talking about organ donation doesn't make any sense and it will upset them much more then they are already upset. A lot of people at this point when I'm talking to them about the process of organ donation, they say, oh gosh, that's an awful job. I would hate to have to talk to families at a time like that. And the way we look at it is, it's a gift to them and to us. We are meeting families at the worst possible moment in their life, okay? There's nothing we can do to fix the circumstance of why we're meeting. But what we're offering them is hope, 
that something good can come out of the circumstance and a silver lining that they can still save someone's life, that their loss of their child or their loved one will have meaning because other lives will be saved. Families love that. And I have to tell you, I wasn't sure of that. I felt the way that other people think, oh, that must be awful in the beginning, until I met a donor family that said this. They had lost both of their kids together on Christmas Eve one year in a car accident. Their young son had drowned at the scene, and they donated his body to science. Their daughter was care flighted to a hospital, put on a ventilator, and eventually died on Christmas Day. So they lost their whole family, essentially, in one fell swoop. When we asked about donation, and the family said yes, the mom said these words. We felt like we were hurtling down a black hole with no end. We couldn't figure out how we were going to get through this. And then you people came in and offered us organ donation. And it was like someone threw a rope into the hole so that we could climb out. That changed the whole way my brain looked at what we do. Because we're not going in there doing something terrible or pushing people to do anything or hurting anyone. We're going in there to a horrible situation that can't be made any worse. And we're trying to make it better. And often we get to make it incredibly better because we get to help them through the process and then we get to sometimes, not always, but sometimes, and more often these days than not, we get to help the donor family communicate with the transplant recipients and sometimes meet. And I'm sure you've seen some of those kinds of stories here locally. Those are so heartwarming because you get to have a family specifically see whose life they saved and you get to have a transplant recipient specifically save the family who made it possible for them to be living and continuing on with their family. No words can describe being in a room when that happens. It's actually pretty darn amazing. And it's kind of why we all do what we do. This is the one where if my heart is on my license, they're not gonna save my life. If the emergency room doctors know that I'm an organ donor, <laughs> they will not try to save me. That is a myth and it's a common myth. But the reality that we have found is this. First of all, most hospitals don't have transplant programs. Emergency room physicians are not transplant docs. <laughs> and so emergency room physicians are there to save lives. They don't look at the information about whether someone's a donor. They don't know. It's just not even part of their questions or thought process. They are trying everything they know how to do to save a life. So if people tell you that one, of course you can tell them just go ahead home and register online so that the heart isn't on your license. That's nothing you need to worry about. There are people who are famous who get transplants, and we can probably sit here and name them, you know. Um, Steve Jobs and a few others and usually when I ask people to name celebrities that get transplants we come up with about 12 to 15 but I told you earlier that 30,000 people a year get a transplant so who are they right they're regular people and I want to tell you that at DPS we have met several people who are transplant recipients or have family members who are or friends and one in particular is a man in your uh, Garland office who got a heart transplant he was living in New York at the time and his donor family was in New Jersey and he got his heart transplant, and then ultimately he moved to Texas because his family is here. And a few years later, he heard our training, and he said, you know, I've always wanted to meet my donor family. Just, I have no idea where they are or what to even do to start. And so we ended up calling the New York Donation Agency and talking to them, and they did the research, and they finally found the family. And guess where the family lives now? Texas. <laughs> so we are going to have an opportunity for one of your own, a DPS employee, to meet a donor family. And I hope that that will also bring a lot of this home for everyone. Once you're clothed, no one can tell that you've been an organ or tissue donor. So it's really important that you know that, that we go out of our way with donor families to make sure that the funeral is a good experience and that donation doesn't get in the way of it in time or in how the person looks. There is no religion at all that actually is against organ donation. And organ donation is done all over the country in all different religions. And this is a, a good place to say that gender doesn't matter and um, skin color doesn't matter. We could all exchange organs as long as our body size and our blood groups are compatible. And so things like religion and things like gender and things like race really have nothing to do with this. And that's kind of a nice message that goes along with organ donation. The other thing is a lot of people will tell you, I would love to be a donor, but I have, and then they give you that list of their whole medical history. The simplest way to just tell them that that's not true is to say your health today is probably not going to be the way your health is at the time when you're in a position to be an organ donor. So don't worry about it. If you want to be a donor, just sign up, and then the medical professionals can make that decision at the time. So we don't encourage people to not sign up because of their health, because most health conditions 
don't rule anyone out for organ donation. You're never too old and you're never too young. We have taken organs from people over 90 and transplanted them. In fact, in Texas, there was someone who was 91 or 92, transplanted his liver, and it worked well. So age is not really an issue. Chronological age is meaningless. It's how well you take care of your body. We are not immigration. <laughs> so if people come to your office and they say, yeah, I want to register, but mm -mm, I don't want them coming after me, <laughs> putting their name on the Donate Life Texas registry will not do anything about their immigration status. We don't care. A lot of people who, don't, who weren't born here and who aren't citizens die here. And their families often say yes to donation and they often are registered. And we don't ask them, are you a citizen? We don't care. If they're in a position to be an organ donor, they could save somebody's life. Why would we care if that person was a citizen or not? We don't care. People think also, um, when we're talking about myths and facts, that having organ donor noted on your driver's license and, or carrying a donor card is what you need to do to become a donor. But a donor card is useless because it's not legal. And having a heart on your license doesn't mean anything. We'll look at it, and that's nice. But we have to look you up on the registry, and we have to see that your name is there, and we have to print out that document of gift to be able to have a legal authorization for someone to be an organ donor. So what makes you a donor is being on the registry. We don't want anyone on the registry if they don't want to be there. So DPS can't take them off the registry. You don't have a no option to put in your computer. You only have a yes option. But if someone wants to be revoked from the registry, tell them to either give them that little orange brochure and tell them to go online. They can do it themselves or to just contact us and we'll take them off the registry. Again, we don't want anyone on the registry that doesn't want to be there. We get about two or three a week, people who want to be re removed. But since you guys are registering about 7,000 a day, we'll take those numbers any day. 7,000 people a day are registering through DPS and we appreciate that. So if a few call us and want to get off the registry, promise you we will take care of it and make it easy for them. When you register online, you can specify which organs and tissues you want to donate. Whereas when you're registering through DPS, you're registering to donate all your organs and tissues. So if there are people who want to donate specific things and don't want to donate other things, then you might encourage them also to go register online where they can make those specific uh, designations. Even if they register through DPS, they can still go online and get into their own individual um, profile and they can change which organs and tissues they want to donate. People don't wear signs that say, I'm waiting for an organ, and they don't wear signs that say, I received a transplant. Some of them do, they wear t-shirts and stuff, but most people don't. And so Texans are gonna come through your line, right? We get phone calls <laughs> when people who are waiting for organs or people who got organs or donor families or living donors come through your line and you guys don't ask them. They are angry <laughs> because they know you're supposed to be asking. And if they go through an office and you don't ask, it hurts them because they know that you're the gatekeepers and they know that if you don't ask, that means the person didn't have an opportunity. And so it really hurts them and they do call us. And then we usually forward those messages to your leadership, just so you know, <laughs> and we tell them, this guy was at this office on this date and he said nobody asked him and could you just follow up on that? So they also don't love it. But what we want you to do, the same way that we give every family that's in a hospital in a crisis situation the opportunity to donate, but they can say no and it's okay, that's all you're doing. You're not forcing anybody to do anything, you're just giving them the opportunity but if you don't ask somebody, then you're actually kind of taking that opportunity away. We were talking about a, a mom of a young boy who had gone to a, a DPS office, had the question asked to her son because he was getting his license, and that got them talking about it for the first time ever at the DPS office. Well, he, her son, decided to register, and he did, and he put his name on the registry and got a little heart on his license, and he ultimately passed away not long after that. And this mom remembered that question. She still had the decision-making power because this was a young teen, but she said, oh, we were at DPS and he registered. Yes, I remember. Oh, yes, I want to do that. And then when she was done with the funeral and all of her family being there and everything that she needed to do for her son's passing, she came back to the DPS office, this mom, with a photo of her son and gave it to the DPS staff and thanked them for helping her and her son have that conversation so that she knew what he wanted when the time came so that she didn't have to try to figure it out because it was so much easier for her. She went and thanked the people at the DPS office. They put that photo up on the wall, got it. They understand why they're asking the question, because it saves lives, but because also it helps families so much in really tough circumstances. 
just want to say thank you to all of the DPS personnel that do ask the question because it does save lives. It saved mine.